Hey folks, my name is Kevin and it's time for some absolutely weird knife nerdery. Today we're going to be explaining the mechanics of this incredibly weird knife, what is easily one of the weirdest and wildest knives in history, full stop. Now, yes, before anyone gets at me in the comments, yes, there is technically an even weirder looking version of what is effectively the same thing. It's put out a few years later by the brand Quartermaster, and it does look even weirder. It's got a kind of post-apocalyptic, the war is over and the robots won kind of feel to it. But mechanically speaking, it works the exact same way as this. So if you're not familiar with what this is, this is the Kershaw ET from Mechanical Geniuses, Grant and Gavin Hawk. And if you don't know what makes this so weird, just aside from just the aesthetics of it, this is how this knife opens and closes. <laughs> oh my God, I love it. It's so freaking weird. Today we're gonna to be talking about how this thing actually works. Not just how do you operate it, but why does it operate the way that it does? But let's start even earlier. Why is it called the ET? Now, yes, that name is obviously supposed to evoke extraterrestrial and just the general otherworldly nature of this. Even if you took away this handle, this blade shape is really, really out there and different from most other knives. When you throw in the aesthetics of this handle, this thing definitely looks like it came from a different planet. But ET is actually an acronym that stands for external toggle. Now, the external part of that is because the mechanism, this kind of toggle concept, first appeared inside an earlier knife from the Hawks, something called the Toad, or Toggle Operated Anti-Drag. They had such wonderful, weird acronym names back then, and so they managed to fit this entire general toggle concept here inside a knife. And in fairness, it was a pretty beefy knife. That knife came out in 2002, and the patent for this general concept was applied for that knife as early as 2004. This knife here, the ET, came out in the very end of 2005, so this version here is still in the patent pending era, because the patent wasn't granted until October of 2006. And they've gone on to use this kind of toggle concept in a lot of their other knives going forward. So let's finally talk about what is a toggle. I mean, in its simplest form, a toggle is something that can be switched between two different states. And so you could consider this knife a toggle that is switching between the open and closed state. And this is the button that lets you do it. So you're pressing this and the knife is switching back and forth between the open and closed states. And much more than most other knives out there, except for like maybe a dual action thing like the deadlock that the Hawks came out later, very few other knives allow you to kind of toggle back and forth between those states the same way. But this knife actually operates as a mechanical toggle. And there's actually two different ways that it's doing that. To better explain that, let's use an example of one of the most common mechanical toggles that people are familiar with in day-to-day -day life a light switch. Now there's lots of different ways that you can implement a mechanical toggle, but this is one of the most common. What we have here is a little lever bar that's switching back and forth between an up state and a down state. And you can tell that it's biased towards those two endpoints. If you move it towards in either direction, it's going to want to finish off that path. What's causing that to happen is the fact that there is a spring inside here. Now, the original versions of switches like this had an actual literal coil spring. Modern versions like this, so this isn't particularly modern, I think from the mid-60s, have simplified that design to have a leaf spring that's pushing along the back, kind of like the leaf spring in a liner lock. Now, obviously, we have a switch right here that's moving back and forth across this fulcrum point right there. But actually, this plastic piece extends into the inside of this as well. It's actually sticking out down here, and that piece is all one piece. And so when you rotate this, that piece that's sticking out inside is rotating back and forth inside this casing. Now, if you think about it, as that piece that's inside rotates back and forth, its depth in this dimension is moving further and further away and then closer and closer back. So that piece, how far it sticks out that way is changing. And it's at its furthest in that distance when it's dead center here. Well, that spring I mentioned is pushing up against the back part of that. And so rotating this switch like this and rotating the internal piece further and further away and then closer and closer back means that you have to compress that spring in order to do that. And once you reach this midpoint and you get past that inflection point, the spring tension is now going to be pushing it back down the other direction. So you can actually balance this right here in the center, if I get it just right. What that means is that the spring is pushing on the lever arm all of its force directly into the pivot. But if I move it to either side of that, now it's going to be off balance. And it's going to push one way or another, depending on what side of that inflection point I'm on. Now, all of these concepts apply to the ET as well. It's just spread out and looks different. But 
all of those concepts are here too. Instead of this pivot right there and a spring pushing along the back and a little tiny lever arm inside, we've got this pivot right here, a much bigger lever arm and this spring down here. Now you can see at the back, we've got a torsion spring and that spring is pushing up on this away like this kind of V motion. But in practice, what that's doing is rotating this piece clockwise and applying rightward pressure on this bar. So that spring is trying to push in against this bar. And just like over on the light switch, we have an inflection point right here, where if we have the blade halfway open, all pressure on this is pushing directly into the pivot and is not pushing one way or the other. And in fact, you can make it just rest like that. But if we move up or down from that inflection point in either direction, it's either going to want to push closed or want to push open. So this is our first toggle. It's caused by the spring force pushing into this bar against this pivot. And if you're on either side of that, there's going to be some lever arm distance there that's going to allow that spring force to push this either open or closed. And you actually can accidentally get it to stick in this balanced position. If you notice, when you pull this lever all the way down, it's rotating it right there to that center point. And you can just let go and it'll be there. Which means to actually open and close this, you have to kind of bounce your hand up and down. You can't just squeeze down, you have to bounce it. Because you have to allow for this to move back up to allow this bar to move down towards the other side. It has to go down and then back up. In practice, the way that this works is by relying on the momentum of the blade. As you're closing this and swinging this down, the momentum of the blade wants to carry this past the inflection point, and now the spring tension wants to push it all the way closed. But again, you have to let up on that for that to work. If you just push like this in either the open or close, you can kind of stop. You have to go up and down. Now there's actually a second place where this is acting as a toggle, and it's actually the opposite direction and is what makes this lock. When we're talking about the opening, it's the spring tension pushing on this lever bar into this pivot. But when we're talking about locking, we're talking about force against the blade spine pushing on this lever bar into this pivot. When you apply negative force to the spine of the blade, it's going to try to rotate the blade closed. But because this is attached to this lever bar, what that means is it's going to try to put a leftward force against this lever bar. You can see that as we rotate this close, this is moving to the left. And just like before, there's an inflection point right about here. It's a little bit harder to show in this direction. But right about here, the force from this bar is pushing directly into this pivot point. This is the inflection point. Anywhere above this, and it's going to want to close the knife. Anywhere below this, and it's going to want to swing down instead of up and push into the handle. So if we're above this, right about there, now if I push on the spine, it's going to close. But if we're below this, right about there, now when I push on this, it's going to be pushing down. The inflection point is right above that, right about there. So below the inflection point, any pressure on this is rotating this downward into the handle. Which means even if you didn't have the spring here, you wouldn't be able to close the knife right now. Because again, it's below the inflection point. So any pressure on the spine is going to push it further down, not up. You would have to manually lift up on this in order to close the knife. But we do have a spring right there pushing this down. And it's actually a pretty firm spring. So you have to pull pretty hard to pull this out which means this is actually locked up really securely without anything else going on. And in practice, your hand is pushing down on this and providing all of its grip strength, holding this down towards the handle and away from that inflection point. Now, a friend asked me, well, couldn't you accidentally push down on this with your pinky finger and pop it up past that inflection point? And technically, yes, if you hold it in a really weird way like this, where you are not applying any pressure towards the middle, you can technically pop this down. Can I even do it? I don't know. I'm not sure if I actually can. I believe that you would be able to push this past that like that. Ooh, yeah, I'm, you can see I am technically able to do this. But in practice, this will never happen. You're going to have grip along the entire space and you're going to be holding that closed. But even if you squeezed really hard and had the strongest pinky fingers in the world, you still wouldn't be able to pop this open under normal conditions because what you're dealing with is the lever arm distance between this pushing it closed and this pushing it open. And so your grip is going to be significantly, significantly more effective at closing this knife than it will be at opening it. And so this is actually a really solid lock, especially when you're holding it, but even when you're not. 
you can't close this. While we're looking at this knife, I wanted to explain a few other weird fun oddities. This clip technically is reversible, so this is a fully ambidextrous knife. It's not the easiest thing in the world to do because you have to get at that screw right there in order to take this off and swap it around. Take off the other screw too. In order to do that, you probably need to take these pieces out. Hmm, you'd also need to take that piece out right there. It's gonna be a bit of a, a complicated disassembly, but it's technically possible. I also wanted to point out that this knife does have a lock, but it's a lock for the closed position. You can see we have this little turn dial here and it says off and on. If we rotate this on, it's gonna cam a little bar up and blockade this. Let's see that happen. Yeah, do you see that right there? That little pin is pushing up against that spot and making it so that if you try to open this, you physically can't. But that lock is only working in the closed position. It's not having anything to do with the open because look, if we pop it up now, it's not even touching. It will prevent you from closing the knife fully because it'll just kind of hit right there. So you definitely don't want to attempt to push that up in the open position. The last thing I'll talk about is the fact that yes, this knife also has a freaking carabiner. How weird and fun is that? The carabiner is made up of a simple U-shaped piece of metal right here that has a little tab on that side and a little tab on this side. There's two little holes right there, and the lever arm distance between those holes means that when you push this down, there's a torque that's trying to splay the two sides of this U-shape together. You can see that as I push it, this side is dropping slightly below that side. That's how most carabiners like this work, but it's just kind of a cool little mechanism if you've never taken the time to look at it. The distance between these is going to determine how hard it is to push this down. If those holes were further apart, it would be easier to splay these. If they were closer together, it would be harder because that's your lever arm distance acting on splitting those two pieces apart from each other. But yeah, how weird is that to have a carabiner on top of everything else that's weird about this knife? I have wanted one of these for so long. This, I saw, I first saw these back in 2005 when they came out, and this was one of the mechanical oddity things that got me excited about knives almost 20 years ago. So I'm so glad to finally have one of these in my collection, especially one in this nice pristine condition, so I can make a video like this and share it with all of you. I hope this made sense. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll catch you all next time.